Hibernation 51. Grizzly's Growls presents Stories from the Hibernation Read by David Grizzly Smith Wild Animals I Have Known by Ernest Thompson Seton As read by David Grizzly Smith The Story of a Cottontail Rabbit Part 5 There is magic in running water, who does not know it and feel it? The railroad builder fearlessly throws his bank across the wide bog or lake or the sea itself. But the tiniest rill of running water he treats with great respect, studies its wish and its way, and gives it all it seems to ask. The thirst-parched traveler in the poisonous alkali deserts holds back in deadly fear from the sedgy ponds till he finds one down whose center is a thin, clear line and a faint flow, the sign of running, living water, and joyfully he drinks. There is magic in running water, and no evil spell can cross it. Tam O'Shanter proved its potency in time of sorest need. The wildwood creature, with its deadly foe following tireless on the trail scent, realizes its nearing doom and feels an awful spell. Its strength is spent, its every trick is tried in vain, till the good angel leads it to the water, the running, living water, and dashing in, it follows the cooling stream, and then, with force renewed, takes to the woods again. There is magic in running water. The hounds come to the very spot, and halt and cast about, and halt and cast in vain. Their spell is broken by the merry stream, and the wild thing lives its life. And this was one of the great secrets that Ragalog learned from his mother. After the briar rose, the water is your friend. One hot, muggy night in August, Molly led Rag through the woods. The cotton-white cushion she wore under her tail twinkled ahead and was his guiding lantern, though it went out as soon as she stopped and sat on it. After a few runs and stops to listen, they came to the edge of the pond. The hyalas in the trees above them were singing, Sleep! Sleep! And away out on a sunken log in the deep water up to his chin in the cooling bath, a bloated bullfrog was singing the praises of Juggerum. "'Follow me still,' said Molly, in rabbit, and flop she went into the pond and struck out for the sunken log in the middle. Rag flinched, but plunged with a little ouch, gasping and wobbling his nose very fast, but still copying his mother. The same movements as on land sent him through the water, and thus he found he could swim. On he went till he reached the sunken log and scrambled up by his dripping mother on the high, dry end, with a rushy screen around them and the water that tells no tales. After this, on warm nights, when that old fox from Springfield came prowling through the swamp, Rag would note the place of the bullfrog's voice, for in case of the direst need it might be a guide to safety and thenceforth the words of the song that bullfrog sang were, Come, come, in danger, come. This was the latest study that Rag took up with his mother. It was really a postgraduate course, for many little rabbits never learn it at all. Part 6. 
No wild animal dies of old age. Its life has, soon or late, a tragic end. It is only a question of how long it can hold out against its foes. But Rag's life was proof that once a rabbit passes out of his youth, he is likely to outlive his prime, and be killed only in the last third of his life, the downhill third we call old age. The Cottontails had enemies on every side. Their daily life was a series of escapes. For dogs, foxes, cats, skunks, coons, weasels, minks, snakes, hawks, owls, and men, and even insects were all plotting to kill them. They had hundreds of adventures, and at least once a day they had to fly for their lives and save themselves by their legs and wits. More than once that hateful fox from Springfield drove them to taking refuge under the wreck of a barbed wire hog pen by the spring. But once there they could look calmly at him while he spiked his legs in vain attempts to reach them. Once or twice Rag, when hunted, had played off the hound against the skunk that had seemed likely to be quite as dangerous as the dog. Once he was caught alive by a hunter who had a hound and a ferret to help him, but Rag had the luck to escape next day, with a yet deeper distrust of ground holes. He was several times run into the water by the cat, and many times was chased by hawks and owls, but for each kind of danger there was a safeguard. His mother taught him the principal dodges, and he improved on them, and made many new ones as he grew older. And the older and wiser he grew, the less he trusted to his legs, and the more to his wits for safety. Ranger was the name of a young hound in the neighborhood. To train him, his master used to put him on the trail of one of the cottontails. It was nearly always rag that they ran, for the young buck enjoyed the runs as much as they did, the spice of danger in them being just enough for zest. He would say, "'Oh, mother, here comes the dog again. I must have a run today.' "'You are too bold, Raggy, my son,' she might reply. "'I fear you will run once too often.' "'But, mother, it is such glorious fun to tease that fool dog, and it's all good training.' I'll thump if I am too hard-pressed, and then you can come and change off while I get my second wind. On he would come, and Ranger would take the trail and follow till Rag got tired of it. Then he either sent a thumping telegram for help, which brought Molly to take charge of the dog, or he got rid of the dog by some clever trick. A description of one of these shows how well Rag had learned the arts of the woods. He knew that his scent lay best near the ground, and was strongest when he was warm, so if he could get off the ground and be left in peace for half an hour to cool off, and for the trail to stale, he knew he would be safe. When, therefore, he tired of the chase, he made for the creekside briar patch, where he wound, that is, zigzagged, till he left a course so crooked that the dog was sure to be greatly delayed in working it out. Then he went straight to D, in the woods, passing one hop to windward of the high log, E. Now stopping at D, he followed his back trail to F. Here he leapt aside and ran toward G. Then returning on his trail to J, he waited till the hound passed on his trail at I. Well, then Rag got back on his old trail at H, followed it to E, where, with a scent balk or a great leap aside, he reached the high log, and running on its higher end, he sat like a lump. A ranger lost much time in the bramble maze, and the scent was very poor when he got it straightened out and came to D. Now here he began to circle to pick it up, and after losing much time, he struck the trail, which ended suddenly at G. And again he was at fault and had to circle to find the trail. Wider and wider circles, until at last he passed right under the log Rag was on. But a cold scent on a cold day does not go downward much. Rag never budged nor winked, and the hound passed. Well, again the dog came around. This time he crossed the low part of the log and stopped to smell it. Yes, it was clearly rabbity, but it was a stale scent now. Still, he mounted the log. It was a trying moment for Rag, as the great hound came sniff sniffing along the log, but his nerve did not forsake him. The wind was right. He had his mind made up to bolt as soon as Ranger came halfway up, but he didn't come. Now a yellow cur would have seen the rabbit sitting there, but the hound did not, and the scent seemed stale. 
So he leapt off the log and ragged one. Part 7 Rag had never seen any other rabbit than his mother. Indeed, he had scarcely thought about there being any other. He was more and more away from her now, yet he never felt lonely, for rabbits do not hanker for company. But one day in December, while he was among the red dogwood brush, cutting a new path to the great creekside thicket, he saw all at once against the sky over the sunning bank the head and ears of a strange rabbit. Now the newcomer had the air of a well-pleased discoverer and soon came hopping Rag's way along one of his paths into his swamp. A new feeling rushed over him, that boiling mixture of anger and hatred called jealousy. The stranger stopped at one of Rag's rubbing trees, that is, a tree against which he had used to stand on his heels and rub his chin as far up as he could reach. He thought he did this simply because he liked it, but all buck rabbits do so, and several ends are served. It makes the tree rabbity so that other rabbits know that this swamp already belongs to a rabbit family and is not open for settlement. It also lets the next one know by the scent, if the last caller was an acquaintance, and the height from the ground of the rubbing places shows how tall the rabbit is. Now, to his disgust, Rag noticed that this newcomer was a head taller than himself, a big stout buck at that. This was a wholly new experience, and filled Rag with a wholly new feeling. The spirit of murder entered his heart. He chewed very hard at nothing in his mouth, and hopping forward onto a smooth piece of hard ground, he struck slowly, thump, 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 which is a rabbit telegram for, get out of my swamp or fight. Well, the newcomer made a big V with his ears, sat upright for a few seconds, and then dropping on his forefeet, sent along the ground a louder, stronger thump, thump, thump. And so, war was declared. They came together by short runs, sidewise, each one trying to get the wind of the other and watching for a chance advantage. The stranger was a big, heavy buck with plenty of muscle, but one or two trifles such as treading on a turnover and failing to close when Rag was on low ground showed he had not much cunning and counted on winning his battles by his weight. On he came at last, and Rag met him like a little fury. As they came together, they leaped up and struck out with their hind feet, Thud, thud, they came, and down went poor little Rag. Well, in a moment the stranger was on him with his teeth, and Rag was bitten, lost several tufts of hair before he could get up. But he was swift afoot, and got out of reach. Again he charged, and again he was knocked down and bitten severely. He was no match for his foe, and it soon became a question of saving his own life. Hurt as he was, he sprang away with the stranger in full chase, and bound to kill him as well as to oust him from the swamp where he was born. Rag's legs were good, and so was his wind. The stranger was big and so heavy that he soon gave up the chase, and it was well for poor Rag that he did, for he was getting stiff from his wounds as well as tired. From that day began a reign of terror for Rag. His training had been against owls, dogs, weasels, men, and so on, but what to do when chased by another rabbit, he did not know. All he knew was to lie low till he was found, and then run. A poor little Molly was completely terrorized, and she could not help Rag, and sought only to hide. But the big buck soon found her out. She tried to run from him, but she was not now so swift as Rag. The stranger made no attempt to kill her, but he made love to her, and because she hated him and tried to get away, he treated her shamefully. Day after day he worried her by following her about, and often, furious at her lasting hatred, he would knock her down and tear out mouthfuls of her soft fur till his rage cooled somewhat, when he would let her go for a while. But his fixed purpose was to kill Rag, whose escape seemed hopeless. There was no other swamp he could go to, and whenever he took a nap now, he had to be ready at any moment to dash for his life. 
A dozen times a day the big stranger came creeping up to where he slept, but each time the watchful rag woke in time to escape. To escape, and yet not to escape. He saved his life, indeed, but, oh, what a miserable life it had become. How maddening to be thus helpless, to see his little mother daily beaten and torn, as well as to see all his favorite feeding grounds, the cozy nooks and the pathways he had made with so much labor, forced from him by this hateful brute. Unhappy Rag realized that to the victor belonged the spoils, and he hated him more than ever he did fox or ferret. How was it to end? He was wearing out with running and watching and bad food, and little Molly's strength and spirit were breaking down under the long persecution. The stranger was ready to go to all lengths to destroy poor Rag, and at last stooped to the worst crime known among rabbits. However much they hate each other, all good rabbits forget their feuds when a common enemy appears. Yet one day, when a great goshawk came swooping over the swamp, the stranger, keeping well under cover himself, tried again and again to drive Rag into the open. Well, once or twice the hawk nearly had him, but Still the briars saved him, and it was only when the big buck himself came near being caught that he gave it up. And again Rag escaped, but was no better off. He made up his mind to leave, with his mother, if possible, next night, and go into the world in quest of some new home, when he heard old Thunder, the hound, sniffing and searching about the outskirts of the swamp, and he resolved on playing a desperate game. He deliberately crossed the hound's view, and the chase that then began was fast and furious. Thrice around the swamp they went till Rag had made sure that his mother was hidden safely and that his hated foe was in his usual nest. Then right into that nest and plump over him he jumped, giving him a rap with one hind foot as he passed over his head. "'You miserable fool, I'll kill you yet!' cried the stranger, and up he jumped only to find himself between Rag and the dog, an heir to all the peril of the chase. Well, on came the hound, baying hotly on the straightaway scent. The buck's weight and size were great advantages in a rabbit fight, but now they were fatal. He did not know many tricks, just the simple ones like double, wind, and hole up that every baby bunny knows. But the chase was too close for doubling and winding, and he didn't know where the holes were. It was a straight race. The briar rose, kind to all rabbits alike, did its best, but it was no use. The baying of the hound was fast and steady. The crashing of the brush and the yelping of the hound each time the briars tore his tender ears were borne to the two rabbits where they crouched in hiding. But suddenly these sounds stopped. There was a scuffle, then loud and terrible screaming. Rag knew what it meant, and it sent a shiver through him, but he soon forgot that when all was over and rejoiced to be once more the master of the dear old swamp. Part 8. Old Oliphant had doubtless a right to burn all those brush piles in the east and south of the swamp, and clear up the wreck of the old barbed wire hog pen just below the spring, but it was none the less hard on Rag and his mother. The first were their various residences and outposts, and the second their grand fastness and safe retreat. They had so long held the swamp and felt it to be their very own in every part and suburb, including Oliphant's grounds and buildings, that they would have resented the appearance of another rabbit even about the joining farmyard. Their claim, that of long, successful occupancy, was exactly the same as that by which most nations hold their land, and it would be hard to find a better right. During the time of the January thaw, the elephants had cut the rest of the large wood about the pond, and curtailed the cottontail's domain on all sides. But they still clung to the dwindling swamp, for it was their home, and they were loath to move to foreign parts. 
Their life of daily perils went on, but they were still fleet of foot, long of wind, and bright of wit. Of late they had been somewhat troubled by a mink that had wandered upstream to their quiet nook. A little judicious guidance had transferred the uncomfortable visitor to Oliphant's hen house, but they were not yet quite sure that he had been properly looked after. So, for the present, they gave up using the ground holes, which were, of course, dangerous blind alleys, and stuck closer than ever to the briars and the brush piles that were left. Well, that first snow had quite gone, and the weather was bright and warm until now. Molly, feeling a touch of rheumatism, was somewhere in the lower thicket seeking a tea-berry tonic. Rag was sitting in the weak sunlight on a bank in the east side. The smoke from the familiar gable chimney of Oliphant's house came fitfully, drifting a pale blue haze through the underwoods and showing us a dull brown against the brightness of the sky. The sun-gilt gable was cut off midway by the banks of briar brush. That purple in shadow shone like rods of blazing crimson and gold in the light. Beyond the house, the barn, with its gable and roof, new gift at the house, stood up like Noah's Ark. The sound that came from it, and yet more the delicious smell that mingled with the smoke, told Rag that the animals were being fed cabbage in the yard. Rag's mouth watered at the idea of the feast. He blinked and blinked as he snuffed its odorous promises, for he loved cabbage dearly. But then he had been to the barnyard the night before, after a few paltry clover tops, and no wise rabbit goes two nights running to the same place. Therefore he did the wise thing. He moved across, where he could not smell the cabbage, and made his supper of a bundle of hay that had been blown from the stack. Later, when about to settle for the night, he was joined by Molly, who had taken her tea berry and then eaten her frugal meal of sweet birch near the sunning bank. Well, meanwhile, the son had gone about his business elsewhere, taking all his gold and glory with him. Off in the east a big black shutter came pushing up and rising higher and higher. It spread over the whole sky, shut out all light, and left the world a very gloomy place indeed. Then another mischief-maker, the wind, taking advantage of the son's absence, came on the scene and set about brewing trouble. The weather turned colder and colder, seemed worse than when the ground had been covered with snow. Isn't this terribly cold? How I wish we had our stove pipe brush pile, said Rag. Good night for the pine root hole, replied Molly, but we have not yet seen the pelt of that mink on the end of the barn, and it's not safe till we do. The hollow hickory was gone, and in fact at this very moment its trunk, lying in the wood yard, was harboring the mink that they feared. So the cottontails hopped to the south side of the pond, and choosing a brush pile, they crept under and snuggled down for the night, facing the wind, but with their noses in different directions, so as to go out different ways in case of alarm. The wind blew harder and colder as the hours went by, and about midnight a fine icy snow came tickling down the dead leaves and hissing through the brush heap. It might seem a poor night for hunting, but that old fox from Springfield was out. He came pointing up the wind in the shelter of the swamp and chanced in the lee of the brush pile, where he scented the sleeping cottontails. He halted for a moment and then came stealthily sneaking up toward the brush, under which his nose told him the rabbits were crouching. The noise of the wind and the sleet enabled him to come quite close before Molly heard the faint crunch of a dry leaf under his paw. She touched Rag's whiskers, and both were fully awake just as the fox sprang on them, but they always slept with their legs ready for a jump. Molly darted out into the blinding storm. The fox missed his spring, but followed like a racer, while Rags dashed off to one side. Well, there was only one road for Molly. That was straight up the wind, and bounding for her life she gained a little over the unfrozen mud that would not carry the fox, till she reached the margin of the pond. No chance to turn now. On she must go. Splash, splash, through the weeds she went, and then plunged into the deep water. And plunge went the fox close behind. But it was too much for Bernard on such a night. He turned back, and Molly, 
seeing only one course, struggled through the weeds into the deep water and struck out for the other shore. But there was a strong headwind. The little waves, icy cold, broke over her head as she swam, and the water was full of snow that blocked her away like soft ice or floating mud. The dark line of the other shore seemed far, far away, with perhaps the fox waiting for her there. But she laid her ears flat to be out of the gale, and bravely put forth all her strength with wind and tide against her. After a long, weary swim in the cold water, she had nearly reached the farther reeds, when a great mass of floating snow barred her road. Then the wind on the bank made strange fox-like sounds that robbed her of all force, and she drifted far backward before she could get free from the floating bar. Again she struck out, but slowly, oh so slowly now, and when at last she reached the lee of the tall reeds, her limbs were numbed, her strength spent, her brave little heart was sinking, and she cared no more whether the fox was there or not. Through the reeds she did indeed pass, but once in the weeds, her course wavered and slowed, and her feeble strokes no longer sent her landward. The ice forming around her stopped her altogether. In a little while the cold, weak limbs ceased to move. The furry nose-tip of the little mother cottontail wobbled no more, and the soft brown eyes were closed in death. But there was no fox waiting to tear her with ravenous jaws. Ragged escaped the first onset of the foe, and as soon as he regained his wits, he came running back to change off and so help his mother. He met the old fox going round the pond to meet Molly, and led him far and away, and then dismissed him with a barbed wire gash on his head, and came to the bank and sought about and trailed and thumped, but all his searching was in vain. He could not find his little mother. He never saw her again. He never knew where she went, for she slept her never-waking sleep in the ice arms of her friend, the water that tells no tales. Poor little Molly Cottontail. She was a true heroine, yet only one of unnumbered millions that without a thought of heroism have lived and done their best in their little world and died. She fought a good fight in the battle of life. She was good stuff, the stuff that never dies. For flesh of her flesh and brain of her brain was rag. She lives in him, and through him transmits a finer fiber to her race. And rag still lives in the swamp. Old Oliphant died that winter, and the unthrifty sons ceased to clear the swamp or mend the wire fences. Within a single year it was a wilder place than ever. Fresh trees and brambles grew, and falling wires made many cottontail castles and last retreats that the dogs and foxes dared not storm. And there, to this day, lives Rag. He is a big, strong buck now, and fears no rivals. He has a large family of his own, and a pretty brown wife that he got I know not where. There, no doubt, he and his children's children will flourish for many years to come. And there you may see them any sunny evening if you've learnt their signal and code. Choosing a good spot on the ground, know just how and when to thump it. Thank you for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Comment on the website at grizzliesgrowls.com. This program is offered under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.